Welcome to Jubilee Church, our Sunday gathering. We've got a brand new series that we've started called One. It's based off of this incredible passage that Paul talks about in Ephesians 4 where he captures one heart and one spirit and one God and one baptism. And it's, it's, it's challenging us as a church, it's challenging us as people. How do we become one? Well, through this series, we're gonna learn how to do that. I'm hoping that you can watch all of the services uh, and, all, and, and everything that God has in his scripture is designed to equip you, challenge you, and hopefully even change you. That's our desire as well. So join us as we uh, have this series called One. I believe it's gonna change your life. All right, are you ready for the word this morning? Can I just pray before we just jump into this? Holy Spirit, thank you for your presence here today. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord, that there's nothing that ever um, is too big, too great, too enormous for you to manage. So, Holy Spirit, we thank you, God, that you are in this room with us. Thank you, Lord, that you come to dwell in us, that you come to speak through us. And, God, I thank you that you've come to speak to all of us in this room today. And I take authority over any assignment of the enemy today that you have no place that you would restrict, that you would distract in Jesus' name. And I thank you, Lord, that we are going to hear your word. We're going to receive your word and our lives are going to be transformed. God, I pray that I would get out of the way so you can have your way. That is always my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, listen, uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, I had the opportunity to share on Sunday, and, um, and <laughs> amazingly enough, Tim let me get up to share again, so that was good, because um, we were talking about offenses. How many of you remember talking about offenses a couple of weeks ago? You're like, I don't want to talk about offenses, right? Well, I really knew that when I, when I walked off the stage that Sunday, that God was not finished with that. And so I told Tim, I really feel like God has more that he needs to speak in this season to our house. And so even though we're wrapping up our series around one and, and talking about being unified, how many of you know this is a big issue that we fight with that keeps us from being unified? When we have offenses, when we have things against one another, when we harbor things, when we hold grudges, when we get offended by authority, when things like that begin to happen, how many of you know that gets in you and you got to deal with it? Jesus talks over and over and over. I could just stand up here today and read scripture after scripture after scripture where he talks about not having a root of bitterness and about what to do with offenses and that offenses will come and, and why you have to forgive and why you have to keep forgiving and why after you forgive, you're going to forgive again. <laughs> because he knew that this was an assignment of the enemy. The enemy is after unity. The enemy is his, his assignment in the earth. He said, the word says he comes to kill, steal, and destroy, right? And he has come to destroy um, unity by bringing division. That, that is a strategy of the enemy. So we talked last time about having triggers, tests, and traps. Triggers, tests. And traps. And we talked about, by the way, the raccoons are now gone from the portable building. So if you missed the message, thank Jesus. If you work for JCA, you are thanking up until everything is in unity. In Genesis. When does the devil show up? When everything looks like it's so unified, nobody can break it up. That's when the devil shows up. He showed up when there was unity, and he came for one purpose, and that was to bring division. Because he was one with God when he was in heaven. He was one as this, the worship leader in heaven. I tell worship leaders all the time, don't be like Lucifer. You don't want to be the one that got kicked out of heaven because you knew better. We have to understand that, that, that the enemy comes to bring division. And he does it in the most subtle ways. He didn't come to Eve with some fire and brimstone and scary red horns. He came to Eve and he's like, you should totally eat that fruit. 
well, what do you mean? God said we shouldn't eat this fruit. Oh, he doesn't really know. He didn't want you to be better than him. You should eat it. You know he wants you to have every good thing. And the enemy just starts to twist the words and the unity that was present there. And so that's when he's going to show up when we're trying to have unity. It's obvious, y'all, in your marriage, in your family, in church. (laughs) If you don't think the enemy is after division, if you are married and you feel so unified when you get married, everything's so great and and, and the honeymoon phase is so nice. And then... And then he chews so loud at the dinner table. He is so disorganized. Help me, Jesus. I'm preaching over here on purpose. I love you, hon. But I have to work at unity with my husband. It would be easier to say, I don't like this, I don't like this, I don't like this, I don't like this, I'm not going to live like this. If you don't change, then I'm all these threats, all these things. And every time I give in to one of those, then I'm inviting the enemy to bring division into my marriage. Every time. Every time that, that I hear somebody in the house of God say, this against that person, this against that person, and they want to be a law unto themselves. You are inviting the enemy to bring division, isolation, and trap you. But we're not going to be that church. It's about being a kingdom family, having a kingdom marriage, about having a kingdom mindset. Amen? When we fight for unity, we defeat his strategy. Because division is his strategy. See, to kill, steal, and destroy is his mission, but division is one of his biggest strategies that he uses. Look around. It's not hard to see it at work. So while we're busy being defensive and selfish, the enemy is winning with offense in your life. I said this last week or two weeks ago. I'm going to say it again. Satan's assignment is destruction. His agenda is division. And his ammunition is offense. Well, I just don't know if I'm offended. Okay. Every one of us have been offended in this room at some point. Why? Because you're human flesh and you're not Jesus. He lives in us. We are striving to become like him. Your weapon is no good without ammunition. We've been cleaning out Tim's family's house this week, and his dad has some, some rifles, things he's had for a long time. He was in the military and, and things. And, um, and so we came across this whole box of ammunition. And I was like, oh, well, we can probably just give that away. And everybody was like, no, 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 no. That's the most valuable thing we need. Why? Because what good is your weapon if you don't have ammunition? <laughs> So the enemy is not walking around with an empty weapon. The enemy is walking around and his ammunition is offense, 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 trigger, trigger, offense, offense. Look at Matthew 24. There's a very clear pattern I want you to pay attention to what we just read. It says, many will be offended. They will betray one another. They will hate one another, and false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Here's the pattern. Offense will turn into betrayal. Betrayal will turn into hate, and hate will lead you right into deception. That's what it says. There's a pattern. There's a pattern. Well, I would never be that deceived. Oh, really? Has anybody ever known someone that you thought they would never... And so many times, it is an open door of offense. It's this one open door. And usually, it doesn't start with offense. It starts with something that makes you mad or upset or hurt or wounded. So it doesn't begin as an offense. 
It just starts when somebody ticks you off. If I can say it in a nice way, y'all are so quiet. But the truth is, there are people and things they will say and do that will get on your very last nerve. And there are things that, and actions that people do and things they say that bring wounds and they bring hurts, intentional or not intentional. And what you do with that anger, what you do with that trigger, what you do with those wounds and those hurts, that is the, the teeter-totter of whether it becomes an offense. How you react to it, how you respond to it, whether you rec recognize what it is, because we we're blaming the wrong thing. We're blaming the wrong people. If there's a wound in you, a person may have done it, but ultimately the enemy has an assignment to wound you. All of this, we can go through this pattern and we find ourselves ending up getting deceived. How is that possible? Because when you're offended and you feel betrayed, you let anger take root in your heart, and you all of a sudden start listening to voices that didn't make sense before. But now all of a sudden, I think they might be right. I'm looking for people to side with me. I want you to come alongside my root of anger, and I want you to justify why it's okay for me to be angry. Now, is anger a real emotion? Yes. Is that something that is going to come up in us? Yes. But what Jesus is trying to tell you is, what do you do with it? Don't let it lay in your heart and fester. Don't let it stay there and remain there and begin to take over. I'm jumping ahead of myself. Offense is a legal intrusion in your life. It's when you align yourself with people that, want, that, are, that are doing the same things, thinking the same way. You create this little offense gang around your life. What is a gang? A gang is somebody, they will stand up for each other, right, wrong, indifferent. And we create that. We were talking at Freedom Weekend, interesting, I didn't even re remember they were sharing testimonies this morning, but... We talk about there's two ways the enemy intrudes your life. There's legal intrusion and there's illegal intrusion. Legal intrusion is where you leave a door open for him. So when we have this anger, these triggers, these things that we allow to remain in us, then what that does is you're leaving the door open. Let me give you a personal experience from my own little life. When I, about three, I may have shared this a couple weeks ago, I can't remember, I'm going to share it again, because it's very traumatic for me. So, my car was parked in my driveway, and I got up to come to church on a Sunday morning, I got up, got in my car, and my center console thing was up, and I was like, that's kind of weird, but, you know, whatever, Sophie's probably in here digging for something, I don't know what's happening. And I go to look for my makeup bag to put on my makeup, and my I can't find it anywhere. Well, I had been traveling, so I called Tim. I'm like, I think I took my makeup bag inside. I think I, think I left it there. So he and Sophie look everywhere. Can't find my makeup bag anywhere. And I'm like, that is so weird. I know, I know it was in my car. I know it was in my car. And listen, I know a makeup bag might not be a big deal to y'all. Can I get any women who would give me an Amen. That it is disrespectful to just mess with my makeup back. I'd rather you steal my wallet. Because I can cancel those credit cards. But I don't remember the color of my foundation. So I couldn't find it anywhere. I could not find it. So we get home. Long story short, Sophie finds a random check from a neighbor down the street. A blank check in our yard. They they're going to take it, and they see policemen fingerprinting a car in a driveway in our neighborhood. So they stop. So now everything's coming together. I was like, I knew somebody stole my makeup bag. And sure enough, someone broke in my car, I say that loosely, and stole my makeup bag. I had a baby gift for Derek and Ashley for the babies. They didn't take that. They took my makeup. They, they, they saved it. God protected your gift. 
But I was like, Mom, that's like a lot of money in that little baby bag. And so, anyway, so the policeman comes, he fingerprints my car, and he says, now, ma'am, was your car unlocked or locked? My car was unlocked, and the key was in it. I know. I'm going to come over here. This is one of the things that is a division in our marriage as well. I'm going to come over here. I, I just trust too many things and get too sidetracked with other stuff. And you have a keyless thing. So it's just literally they could have stolen my car. The whole car was unlocked. I'm just saying to them, come on in and steal my makeup bag. Come on in and steal my car. Just come and do whatever you want. So I had to look at the officer and say, it was unlocked. And I, he did not ask me if the key was in there, so therefore I did not tell him that the key was in there. I just said it was unlocked. But my point is, why should I be mad that somebody got in my car and stole it when I didn't lock it? But this is, this is how the enemy take, gets root of things in your life. Because we leave the door unlocked. And he has legal intrusion to our life. Is he still trespassing on private property in my life? Yes. But you let him in. And unfortunately, your makeup bag's going to get stolen. I went in uh, Ulta and Sephora, like both, and I was like, my makeup bag got stolen. And I was just like, all this. And I'm telling you, those girls were like, that is just disrespect. And I was like, it sure is. I was like, I love you girls. They're like, come here. We're going to find your foundation color. It's okay. We're going to help you spend $500 in here on makeup. Didn't you use this expensive kind? I was like, I think so. I don't know. It was purple. I don't know. But we leave doors open for the enemy. That's how offense gets in, is when you let him legally intrude. Now, offenses are either picked up or put on. Picking up an offense, you make the action choice to pick it up and carry it. Sometimes you treat it like a newborn baby and you nurse it and you love it and you protect it and you walk around with it and you take care of it and you let it, you feed it so it grows. That's picking up a fence. And pretty soon you're carrying around a toddler and you wonder why you can't walk and you can't breathe and you can't, you can't help anybody else because you can't put down your toddler offense to help someone else because you've been feeding it. When you feed things, they grow. Offenses also get put on us by other people's actions and behaviors and words and things they do. But you still are not required to carry what somebody else puts on you. If I don't want this jacket on, I could take off this jacket today, which I am kind of hot. I would like to, but I'm not going to. But I... I I don't have to wear this, even though I put it on, or maybe Tim helped me put it on this morning. I don't have to wear it. I can choose to take it off. So sometimes we want to do the blame game and, and just say, but so-and-so did this to me. So I have to care, I have to wear this the rest of my life. That's a lie. That's a lie. That's a lie. That would be illegal intrusion in your life. Illegal intrusion. Are y'all with me? Y'all are still thinking about my makeup. I know you are. Listen, we have to know the difference. And we can be offended, y'all, by so many little things. Offense is the custom of our culture. Forgiveness is the custom of the kingdom. Offense is the custom of our culture. It's normal, it's accepted, you belong if you have a soapbox to stand on and be offended at someone or something. And even more support if you say, do it publicly. That's our culture. That's the custom of our culture. That's not kingdom. That's what Jesus was trying to tell us in Matthew 24. 
He's like, listen, don't jump into that. Listen, look at John, um, John 18. This is when Jesus had been arrested. He was about to go to the cross for you and I. They were about to beat him to a bloody pulp where he was unrecognizable. He was about to take every single sin and offense that would ever come your way on his physical body, on his mind, on his spirit. And he was standing in front of Pilate. And Jesus hardly said anything the whole time from the time he got arrested till he got on the cross. This was the only time he talked. And in John 18, it said, Pilate said to him, do I look like a Jew? Your people and your high priest turned you over to me. What did you do? And in verse 36, Jesus answered, my kingdom, said Jesus, doesn't consist of what you see around you. If it did, my followers would fight so that I wouldn't be handed over to the Jews. But I'm not that kind of king. I'm not the world's kind of king. Then Pilate said, so are you a king or not? And Jesus answered, you tell me because I am king. I was born and entered this world so that I would witness to the truth. And everyone who cares for the truth, who has any feeling for the truth, will recognize my voice. In, in, in the original King James Version, it basically says, I am not this kingdom. I don't have an earthly kingdom. And we find ourselves caught up in earthly kingdom culture. We find ourselves caught up in this, this culture where the custom says it's okay to be offended. It's okay to be right. It's okay to be validated. It's okay to be justified. It's okay to be mad. It's okay to be hurt. It's okay to be wounded. But it's not okay because Jesus said, I want to take that from you. I want to heal you. I want you to be free. I don't want you to carry that around. I don't want you to have to wear that as a label. I don't want that to be the thing that prevents you from your purpose. So he's saying, listen, get out of your mindset that we have to be like the culture around us. He said, I'm not that kind of king. And that's who we follow. And he said, the ones who know the truth know me and they know my voice. An offensive voice will never come from the king. We got to live by different rules. Point at somebody and say, you got to live by different rules. Y'all are so unconvincing. You got to live by different rules. No, you got to live by different rules, different customs. You got to change your mindset, different cultural norms. We don't live in the enemy's culture. We live in it, but we don't, we don't become of it. That's when he said, be, be in the world, but not of the world. And you can't be so spiritual that you're no earthly good. Please. Nobody is going to listen to you. Well, thou is, saith, thou is, shouldeth. Be normal. Act like Jesus. Jesus walked around with normal people. So how do we combat this? John 13, 34 and 35 says, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. He says it twice. You know if Jesus has, you know if you're a parent and you got to say it twice, you need them to get it. Don't touch the stove. I mean, don't touch the stove. He said, Love each other. As I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are really my disciples. So if I'm walking around mad and offended and angry and hurt and wounded and all this junk that comes along with me that I want everybody else to have to manage, deal with, see, experience, ew, Remember I gave the example last time that we're like, well, I think people in the world treat me better than people in the church. That's great. Your expectation of the world is down here. Your expectation of people in the church is up here. 
So of course you don't care what, that the world treats you better. You have no expectation that they're supposed to. But we have that expectation of believers and Christians in the church, and we should. And we should. But we have to demonstrate love one to another. Let it start in your personal relationships. Let it start with your family. Let it start with your children. Let it start with your spouse. Let it start with your friends. Let it start with those who are closest to you. Because if you can't show love there, you're not going to show it out there. It's so much easier to love them than love him. Well, of course it is. Because you don't even know them. You don't have to share a bedroom with them. You don't have to share a bathroom with them. You don't have to eat food at their table every night. We have to love one another. He didn't say prove your opinion to be right. He said prove that you're my disciples. By your love for one another. That's his culture. That's God's culture. Jesus, help us. Help us, Lord. To walk in your culture. Help us, God. We need you. We need you. I was having a conversation with Jim Minnelli, who's in town this weekend, and, and he was asking me, he's like, what is your prayer right now? I said, every day, my, my first up prayer is, God, I need you. Sometimes you need to not make it all super spiritual and just throw your hands up and say, God, I need you. God, I need you. I don't have all the answers. I'm fighting this anger. I'm fighting this thing. I just need you. I'm not happy today, but happiness is not, is, is not eternal. I, I need you today. Try praying that prayer this week. I need you. <laughs> Jesus says to Peter, <clears throat> don't forgive. Peter says, what if somebody does something wrong to me? And he says, how many times should I forgive? Seven? I think because he picked seven because there's seven days in a week and he thought somebody's going to make me mad every single day of the week so I should just be ready. How many times? Jesus says not just seven, seven, 70 times seven. Why? It's not about the number. You can multiply it. It's not about that. It means it's not about keeping record. It's about losing count. Well, I just don't know if I can. Well, it's a decision. It's a choice. Are y'all still with me? Okay, I'm watching the time. I'm going to wrap. Listen, when I'm offended, y'all, I don't have grace for people. And that's not a good place to be. Amen? My offense will become the prison that hinders my, my purpose and where I'm supposed to be headed because I'll get so caught up here. Joseph is my greatest example of this. Go read the life of Joseph. I don't have time this morning. Maybe one day we can do a whole series on Joseph. He's one of my favorite people in the Bible. Why? Because he had so many things done wrong to him, and all he wanted was what God wanted his whole life. And if there was anybody who had reason to be offended, it was Joseph. Betrayed by his own brothers, wrongly accused of adultery, put in prison, forgotten by his friends. Let's just go down the list. All the things, betrayal, abandonment, all those things because he dealt with the things instead of allowing them to become roots in him. He was able, it propelled him into his purpose. And even when he was standing in the place of his purpose as the leader and as the ruler, second in command, and he was in charge of all these things, he still had to stand there and look at his brothers and forgive them. And then if that's not enough, just go look at what Jesus did for you. And let's see how bad you have it. Proverbs 18, 19 says, An offended friend is harder to win back than a fortified city. Arguments separate friends like a gate locked with bars. Proverbs 19, 11 says, Sensible people control their temper. Who feels like I should say that again? <laughs> Sensible people control their temper. They earn respect by overlooking wrongs. Sensible people aren't controlled by their feelings. I want to give you three things, and this is, if I title this message, I'm going to call it feelings, faith, and forgiveness. Feelings, faith, and forgiveness. 
why am I starting with feelings? Because that's what drives us most of the time. Our feelings and our emotions. God gave you your emotions. They are not something you're supposed to suppress. You can't get rid of them. They're never going to go away. I don't care how much you medicate them. You still have emotions. That's why there's been recent all these studies around emotional intelligence. Right? But here's the issue. I say it like this. We get in our feels about people. I'm just in my feels about it. We get in our feels about circumstances, words, what they did, what they said, what they posted. And we allow our emotions to begin to drive us. And it begins to drive a wedge right into our hearts. And we, we find ourselves responding out of a place of offense and we take the bait. Our feelings, will, 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 our feelings are powerful. And they will push you to that place. We are consumed with our own feelings and we are consumed with how people feel about us. It's quiet because I know that's truth. We'll just talk about me. Let's not talk about you. I get consumed with my own feelings. And I get consumed how people feel about me. I don't like anybody to be mad at me. I don't like anybody to be disappointed in me. Even though I'm a super strong personality, that will really bother me, like to the point I can't sleep. Like I don't like that. But I know there are people that probably feel that way about me. And I have to come to grips with, I can't let my feelings control me. I can't let my feelings consume me because I will get off course. Even though God created your feelings, he didn't mean for your feelings to be in charge. Right? So when we get in our feels about stuff, that's one of those legal intrusions to the enemy. To open your door and steal your emotional makeup bag. Whatever it is for you. Sorry, it's a, it's a source in me right now. I'm working on it. It's a problem. They did catch the people, by the way, who broke in all the cars. Didn't get my makeup bag back, but they probably looked in there. They're like, there's no money, and they tossed it. And I'm like, no. Listen, when we get in our feelings, we validate offenses. When we get in our feelings, we validate offenses. They take root and they will begin to sprout in your life and they will become poison that will choke out the life of you. All right, I'm going to end in this. Luke 17. Are you all still with me? I know this is hard. I know this is raw and real. But we have to get this, y'all, because Jesus was telling us, hey, this is going to be an issue that's going to come up in your life over and over and over and over and over and over and over. And don't act like the world. And don't get in this hatred and anger and betrayal. Don't get in these places. Grab a hold of it and deal with it before it gets too deep. It's like April was sharing from Freedom Weekend. She said, deep calls on a deep. We need a different kind of deep. And instead, God can't get deep in our lives because there's too many roots in the way. Luke 17, verse 1. Jesus is talking again. And he said to the disciples, it is impossible that no offenses should come. What did he say? It's impossible. That no offenses are going to, in other words, offense is going to show up in your life. Because people are crazy. And that's okay. They need Jesus. And if you're too busy being offended, they won't find Jesus in you. It's impossible that no offenses should come. But woe to him through whom they do come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. Who? Oh, yourself. Not everybody else, right? You need to fix this and you need to fix this and you need to deal with that and you need to deal with this and you need to deal with that. Because I got it all figured out over here. No. He said, take heed to yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. What are you supposed to do? Forgive. And if he sins against you seven times a day and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. This sounds horrible. Why? 
because we want to be justified in our feelings. This next verse is my favorite verse. Verse 5, and the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Jesus is like, hey, you, you people are going to come. You're going to get offended. They're going to make you mad. They're going to trigger you. They're going to wound you. It would be better for you to tie something around your neck that will sink you to the bottom and drown if you can't forgive them. And the disciples are like, we need more faith then. We just can't do this. Increase our faith, Lord. That's how I feel. On the average day, when I get triggered by something, I'm like, Jesus, you're going to have to increase my faith today. Because if I deal with this in my flesh, help me, Lord. I'm going to be just like them. I'm going to be, I'm going to be walking my way right into the enemy's trap. I'm going to grab a hold of that, and I'm going to stand there in my flesh till the day is long. You know what it takes to let go of the bait? Faith. Faith. Because the disciples said, my Lord, you've told us all that stuff. They've been walking around watching Jesus heal the sick, cast demons out, all this stuff. And they're like, you're going to have to increase our faith to forgive. Because it's one of the hardest things to do. Verse 6. So the Lord says, if you have faith as a mustard seed... You can say to this mulberry tree, and in the, in the original King James, it says sycamine tree. Sycamine tree. Remember that. I'm going to talk about it. Be pulled up by the roots and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. And which of you having a servant plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he comes from the field, come at once and sit down and eat, but he will not rather say to him, prepare something for my su supper, and gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk, and afterwards you will eat and drink. Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise, you, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say we are, un we are unprofitable servants, for we have done what was our duty to do. Do you know what he's saying there? He's saying, why, why are you needing all this thanks and all these accolades for something that should just be required of you to do? This isn't something that is optional in your life, in other words. Nobody needs to come up, like, if, if, I, um, if I cook dinner for my family, I'm very grateful that they say thank you to me about it. But ultimately, it's my responsibility to feed my children. Maybe I go through McDonald's, maybe I cook. Either way, it's my responsibility. And I'm grateful that they say thank you, and that's great. But at the end of the day, whether they say thank you or not, it's still my duty and my responsibility. That's what he's saying about forgiving. That's what he's saying about offenses. You're not getting it, y'all. That's what he's saying. I'm telling you, this is a problem. Now, here's what's interesting. In Matthew 17, he talks about this same thing. He says, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move, and it will move. So why in this one is he talking about a tree instead of a mountain? Well, if you read in Matthew 17, before he says you need faith as a mustard seed, like a must to mustard seed to be able to do this, he was talking about casting out a demon. Because there was a boy who came who was possessed, and they couldn't cast it out. And so they went to Jesus, they're like, we don't know what to do with him. And Jesus is like, come out, what's wrong with you? If you have this much faith, you can say to a mountain, move. But in this one, he's not talking about trying to set someone free or heal someone. He's talking about unforgiveness. He's talking about offenses. And he says, now i got to equate it to a tree. Because a tree has what, y'all? Oh, y'all, see? Y'all are the best class ever. Yes, a tree has roots. <laughs> and he's saying to them, listen, you need the faith that can pull the roots up. Say to a tree that the roots come up and you get planted in the sea. What does that mean? Well, the second thing we're talking about, right, we're getting out of our fields and we're talking about faith. 
And he began to say, this is a prescription that we need, right? Here's interesting facts about a sycamine tree, which is a type of a mulberry tree. Are y'all ready for just a super quick, like two minute history lesson on a sycamine tree? I didn't know, I had to go look it up. There's lots of people who have preached on this and I was like, I have never heard this ever. So some of you may have heard it because it's pretty apparent. So this is what a sycamine tree looks like, right? It's a type of this tree or a mulberry tree. So there's four things I want you to know about this tree that I learned and I want you to know. Number one is it has the most um, complicated and deep root system of any tree. You can put that other picture up there. So its roots are all tangled and they grow over each other and around each other and they grow deeper and deeper and deeper and tangled and tangled and tangled. And to uproot a sycamine tree is almost impossible because to get to all the roots is just almost impossible. Listen, we have a, a, an oak tree with roots that have grown up and our driveway is cracking in half from this root. I don't even want to have to go after that root, much less that mess. But he, this is an example that he's talking about, hey, you got to have faith to uproot this. You got to have the faith, y'all, to uproot this. The second thing about a sycamine tree is when, um, when they used to like use wood that was near them or common wood, this was wood that nobody else really needed for any reason and they would use it to make caskets. So a sycamine tree was known for the, its wood being used to make caskets. Do you know what you do with a casket? You put dead things in it. Number three, it does produce a fruit. It's similar to a fig. It looks red, and I, I did have a picture, but I didn't put it up there. But if you take it off the tree and you bite it, it's extremely bitter. It has no... Uh, sweetness to it at all. It's very pungent. And so when you take the fruit, nobody really wants to eat the fruit of this tree because even though it looks nice and it looks like it's going to taste good, it's bitter. That's why I was telling you, you can have all these gifts in your life, but if somebody takes a bite of your life, they get bitter because you are offended. The fourth thing, which is the thing I hate the worst about this tree, is that its fruit is pollinated by wasps only. A wasp has to sting the fruit to pollinate it. Bees don't pollinate this fruit. Now, y'all, I hate wasps. I have this healthy fear God's going to deliver me of, of wasps. Flying wasps, yellow jackets mud daubers, red hornets, I don't know, all the things. Just, I, listen, if a wasp came down and was flying here right now, somebody's life would be in danger because I would be like, Whoa, right? When, I, when, I, when we were getting ready for um, our backyard a few years ago and we have an umbrella, you know, it was down over a table and it had been kind of down all winter and we were out there just cleaning and I had a broom and it had just some, stuff and cobwebs and things. And so I was like beating it with the broom and all of a sudden I hear a zzzz because there was a hornet's nest that had, they had built up inside that umbrella. Y'all. Tim is mowing the yard in the front. He has no idea this is happening. Sophie was still little enough. She was taking a nap. Nobody else was house. I took off running y'all like, I mean like a crazy woman. Like if you've ever, I mean, if it had been on video, it would have gone viral. It would have been fantastic. So I am running, I'm in flip-flops. So as I'm running, I'm like, Pew, you know, and I slide and fall and I'm trying to get back up and then I slide and fall on this side. And then I got stung twice and I'm down, my hair is a mess. I have grass stains, all, true story. I have grass stains all over my clothes. It is just a hot mess, y'all. <laughs> And I'm like, I am so wounded by falling and running from the wasps. Then had I just jumped in the pool and gone under, they would have left me alone. But how many of you know when you're running for your life, you will, uh, you will do things that don't make sense. 
So I don't like wasps. I don't want to be stung by a wasp. I don't want a wasp to come near me. I, w- I don't even want them to think about using their little stinger on me. But here we have this fruit that you have to be stung in order to be pollinated. Do you know what pollinate means? It means they take it from there to somewhere else. So when the wasp, in other words, you have to get stung. Something has to make you mad. Something has to upset you. It's not by accident he used this tree instead of a mountain. Because he's saying, listen, roots are dangerous. And they're going to grow into something that is going to be so deep-seated in your life that you are not even going to know where to start. It's so entangled. And he's trying to get us to understand, don't let it get to this place. Because if you just have this much faith, you can say to those roots, you can say to those things, be uprooted and planted where? In the sea. What does that represent? The presence of God. It represents being planted where his, the Holy Spirit is constantly flowing over our lives. And I don't get these deep roots in the middle of the sea because I can just stay there and I stay in his presence and I don't allow those things to grow in my life. Roots are dangerous, and I really am wrapping up. Turn with me to Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, 14. In every relationship, be swift to choose peace over competition. And run swiftly toward holiness. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Watch over each other. I'm going to say that again. Watch over each other. To make sure that no one misses the revelation of God's grace. And make sure that no one lives with a root of bitterness sprouting within them. Which will only cause trouble and will poison the hearts of many. How, how, what did he say about those that will be offended? Many. Because what I allow to be pollinated out of my life is what affects the lives around me. And so if I am allowing you to be influenced by the hurts and the wounds and the offenses in my life, then I'm going to now spread that poison to you. And it'll usually start with my husband is where the poison will start flowing first. Why? Because we haven't dealt with the root. This isn't a new concept to most of us in this room. We know we have roots of things. We know that things have to be pulled up by the root. But he's saying, don't let it sprout. Don't let it take root in you. Right? We have to be planted. We have to be committed. We have to be submitted. I love that he says, you don't just pull the roots of your tree up and just, it goes anywhere with the wind of doctrine. It says, be planted. Why? Because you need authority in your life. Well, I don't need authority. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Have you ever been to a stoplight where not all of a sudden the, the power knocked out the traffic lights and everybody's like, which, who's going to go where? We need authority. <laughs> I don't want to get hit by a car because I'm not sure whether to go. And I need somebody to stand there and say, hey, 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 wait right now. You go ahead and go. No, wait right now. We need authority. We need to be submitted. And I gently say, whatever you're not submitted to will offend you. Let's just use my life again. All all week, you know, it's been, well, a couple of weeks, Tim and I, we're, we're doing a lot of different things right now. We're managing a lot of things. And literally, God said, because I've been so frustrated, and Tim knows this, I love him, but I've been so frustrated in some areas. And God said, Angela, you're getting offended because you're not submitted. See how easy it is to talk about me and not you? Isn't that great? Why is that an issue? Because where I'm not submitted, I will get offended. 
That includes in the house of God. That includes in your marriage. That includes in, in with your boss, any authority and leaders in your life. Authority doesn't feel good. I don't like somebody to tell me what to do or not do. But that's a legal intrusion of offense when you're not submitted. You gotta be planted. Planted means that I'm submitted to the ground by which I am planted in. I'm submitted to the atmosphere, what kind of soil I'm in. We need faith to do that. Can I get an amen? We need faith. The last thing, and this is, an, is, this is the, the icing on the cake, is you just got to learn to forgive. We got to learn to forgive. Forgiveness is a decision. Say that to yourself since you don't want to say it to somebody else. Forgiveness is my decision. Forgiveness is my decision. If I need to forgive somebody, Tim can't do that for me. Jadine is a, a true friend and an armor bearer and a lot of things in my life, but she can't forgive somebody for me. It's my decision to forgive them. And that this is one of the superpowers you have by which to pull up those roots, is this thing called forgiveness. It's not an emotion, it's not a feeling, it's not temporary, it doesn't matter how you feel about it, it's a decision. And forgiveness doesn't mean they're right and you're wrong or you're right and they're wrong. It's not about that, it's about releasing it. Forgiveness does not mean it gets erased from your memory. But what it means is when I choose to forgive and I make that decision, when the memory comes back up, how I respond to it, how I react to it will be completely different. That's when you know you've truly forgiven. I know I'm treading on the enemy's ground today. I'm okay with that. Because he keeps us trapped in this prison because we will not, we, we will pride these fingers but we'll just hold on for dear life with these two because what they did to me was wrong yes it was wrong but you have to let it go because it's holding you prisoner Ephesians 4 and verse 30 says and do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you. I'm angry. Somebody's angry with me. Can you lower that just a little bit, the guitar? Matthew 5 says this. Matthew 5 says this. Verse 23, so if you are offering your gift at the altar and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go first and be reconciled to your brother and then come offer your gift. What is that talking about? That's not talking about your offense. It's that you know somebody has something against you. This is the next level. <laughs> this is the next level. I didn't do anything wrong. That's their problem. He says, don't bring your stuff up to the altar. And you remember, I had that argument. I had that situation. I don't feel like I was at fault, but I know they have issue with me. He says, leave your gift at the altar and go reconcile that thing. That means you have to, you might have to say, I'm sorry when maybe you don't feel like you have anything to be sorry about. Well, that's just too much, Angela. Jesus didn't know what all you were gonna do and he said, I'm sorry for you at the cross. I don't know how many times Tim and I have sat in front of people that we didn't feel like we were in the wrong, but we looked at them and said, I'm so sorry, what can, I, what can we do to fix it? That's what the Bible says. Jesus said it, not me. Matthew 5. You have this gift. You go first and take care of that. 
We have to be the responsible one and make the decision to forgive and go fix it.